tenacity, grit, underdog. He was a three-time NHL All-Star, Olympic gold medalist, King Clancy Memorial Trophy recipient, and a perennial top five goalie in his prime. He was a goalie who was capable of single-handedly winning games in playoff series, a player who never let any bad situation dictate who he was and how he'd act. Standing at 5'11", 190 pounds, he went undrafted and would go on to have an impressive 19-year career. He's Cujo, the Mad Dog, number 31, Curtis Joseph. Curtis Shane Monroe, later known as Curtis Shane Joseph, was born on April 29, 1967 in Keswick, Ontario, Canada, and his upbringing was truly heartbreaking. His biological mother was an unmarried teenage mom and there was no way she could support young Curtis as a baby, so she gave him up to her co-worker at the nursing home she worked at. Joseph's foster parents, Howard and Jean, raised him along with three stepsisters and a stepbrother. Happily ever after? Not quite, as his foster parents eventually filed for divorce. Mom ended up remarrying and Joseph was suddenly living with new dad Harold, mom and two new older stepbrothers. Jean was a drug addict and Harold was more of a guardian than a fatherly figure, and as a result Joseph was often neglected in his formative years. He would eat plenty of processed foods and frozen hamburgers, and he would often struggle to find enough to eat. He had the bare minimum when it came to clothes and he didn't have many toys to play with. He had to take the bus to school and the nearest bus stop was so far away from their house, dad had to pick him up from the bus stop, but he had narcolepsy that caused him to fall asleep and thus he was often late and poor Joseph had to wait in the cold, in the dark, all by himself, sometimes until as late as 10 p.m. But being the half-glass-full type of guy that he is, Joseph would have his hockey stick and ball with him as he used his spare time to practice. Curtis Joseph grew up in a home for the mentally ill, and he would consistently be exposed to verbal aggression, indecent exposure, and other bizarre situations. He would also often be left without his blanket and finding a dry place to sleep was rare because the cats there used his mattress as a litter box. Joseph grew up in poverty, but his humbling origins helped shape his mental toughness and strengthened his tenacity, traits that would be essential to his later success. Curtis Joseph didn't start playing ice hockey until he was 10, and he didn't skate very well, ultimately pushing him to become a goalie. He felt like he didn't have a real family at home, but being a part of a hockey team allowed him to have one. Being in the locker room gave him the relationships that he so very much desired, and God bless the other parents as they often gave him advice as well as making sure he had a ride to practices and games. Hockey may have just been a sport for other kids, but for Curtis Joseph, hockey was a way for him to escape his cruel reality. Hockey was his life. Fast forward to the age of 20. Joseph would play for the Notre Dame Hounds, recording 25 wins, 4 losses, and 7 ties. He would lead them to the Centennial Cup Championship, and despite playing for the University of Wisconsin after that, he would be passed over by every single team and went undrafted in the NHL entry draft. Yet his dream of playing in the NHL did not waver, and in 1989, he signed an entry-level contract with the St. Louis Blues. During Joseph's six seasons in St. Louis, he registered an excellent win-loss record as he started to become a household name. He would develop the reputation of being a workhorse, regularly playing the bulk of the games and consistently seeing plenty of shots. He was a goalie who never gave up on a play, making key, sometimes miraculous saves to keep the dream alive. Most importantly, he gave his team hope when they had no business of being in a game or a playoff series. Curtis Joseph was the ultimate underdog, leading average teams to victory time and time again. His nickname Cujo was taken from the first two letters of his first and last names, and perhaps fittingly, he used a picture of the rabid dog from the Stephen King novel on his mask wherever he played. Like that dog, Curtis Joseph was fierce, intense, and intimidating. In the 92-93 season, his fourth with the team, Joseph backstopped the Blues to a first-round sweeping upset of the number one seed, the Chicago Blackhawks. Despite losing to the Maple Leafs in the second round, it was Joseph's clutch performances that pushed the series to seven games. It seemed like only a matter of time until Joseph would lead the Blues back to the promised land. But that all changed with the arrival of head coach Mike Keenan. Iron Mike believed that no player was bigger than the team, and it was this military style of coaching that made players terrified of him. 
Cujo was no different, and after he buckled under the pressure in back-to-back -back playoffs in 94 and 95, while the Blues suffered early round exits, Joseph, who was just about to enter his prime, was dealt to the Edmonton Oilers in a move that sent shockwaves throughout the hockey world. At the time of the trade, Joseph was not under contract, and him and the Oilers couldn't agree to one, so he was left unsigned heading to the 95-96 season. He had been passed over again, and he had to sign a minor league contract with the Las Vegas Thunder to continue playing. But despite such ill treatment, he reported to Vegas with a stellar attitude and absolutely dominated with a 12-2-1 record, giving a stern reminder to his doubters that he was Cujo always battling, always contesting, always going to claw his way back. And the Edmonton Oilers, whose fan attendance was so low they were in danger of relocating to another city, had no other choice but to offer Joseph an NHL contract, and he would prove to be essential in bringing back an Edmonton fan base that had become disengaged since the end of their dynasty in the early 90s. The Oilers had now been relegated to an average team, and their subpar 500 record would mean they would just narrowly squeak into the playoffs. In the 96-97 season, the Oilers would secure a spot in the playoffs as the seventh seed, set to face off against the Dallas Stars, a team that had the second best record in the NHL. Everyone had written off the Oilers, and playing the games felt like just a formality, but Curtis Joseph had other ideas as he practically stood on his head to push the series to a seventh and deciding game. Game 7 was tied at 3 heading into overtime, and Joseph's save on Joe Neuendijk to keep the season alive remains one of his most pivotal saves of his career. And typically, if there's a big save on one end, that might result in a chance on the other, and just 20 seconds later, it was Todd Marchant who broke loose to win Game 7 in overtime, completing the major upset. Curtis Joseph had previously floundered in the playoffs, and this display not only restored his reputation, but he had once again proved his doubters wrong. In the second round, the Oilers would crash out of the playoffs at the hands of the defending champions, the Colorado Avalanche, but the damage had already been done. Curtis Joseph had become a cornerstone goalie. In the following 97-98 season, the Oilers once again entered the playoffs as the seventh seed and was again a clear underdog. Could Lightning strike twice for the heavily overmatched team from Northern Alberta? After jumping out to a 3-1 series lead, the Avalanche were one win away from advancing, but Joseph saved his best hockey with his team's backs against the wall, as he only let in one goal in the next three games, recording a shutout streak that lasted 163 minutes to complete another Game 7 miracle. His save in Game 7, in which he seemed down and out only to throw out his paddle, remains his most iconic save of his career and perfectly exemplified his never give up mentality and unshakable desire to stop pucks. Even though that's as far as the Oilers got in the playoffs, the two upsets in back-to-back -back seasons were enough to bring the Oilers back to relevance, and Joseph became the most sought-after goalie heading to free agency. Joseph decided to sign with his hometown Toronto Maple Leafs and instantly turned the team into a force to be reckoned with. In the 98-99 season, he backstopped the Leafs to the Eastern Conference Finals, ultimately losing to the Buffalo Sabres. He was a runner-up for the Vesna Trophy as the top goalie in 1999 and in 2000, as he continued his strong play. He would also win the King Clancy Trophy as the best leader on and off the ice. In 2002, Joseph began the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City as the starter for Team Canada, but after an unconvincing loss in the first game, he lost the crease to Martin Brodeur, and Joseph was left on the bench as Team Canada bounced back to win its remaining games to win the gold medal. In the 2002 playoffs, the Leafs returned to the Eastern Conference Finals as Joseph once again played a key role in the playoff run, but they ultimately fell to Carolina, and that was the closest he would get to a Stanley Cup. After the season, Joseph and the Leafs couldn't agree to a contract, and he walked into free agency, signing for the Detroit Red Wings as he replaced six-time Vesna winner Dominic Hasek, who had retired after their recent Stanley Cup championship. Any goalie would have found it hard to follow Hasek's act, and after crashing out of the 0-3 playoffs to the seventh-seeded Mighty Ducks of Anaheim, the fans turned on Joseph as he was turned into the scapegoat. 
As Hashik returned from retirement in the following summer of 2003, Joseph was sent down to the miners as he was let go once again. But we've seen this before, and he was always going to continue fighting. And when Hashik sustained his season-ending injury, it was Joseph who was called back, holding no grudges ready to be at his team's disposal. Heading into the playoffs, Joseph was again overlooked as it was Manny Legacy who became the starter. And when he struggled midway through the series, Curtis Joseph came in relief to win the next two games to send the Red Wings into the next round. And despite losing to the Red Hot Calgary Flames in round two, Joseph posted a 1.39 goals against average and a .939 save percentage to lead all goalies in the playoffs. Over the next four seasons, Joseph would suit up for the Phoenix Coyotes, Calgary Flames and the Toronto Maple Leafs again. But at this point, he was clearly past his prime. And in 2010, he announced his retirement, at the time finishing fourth all-time with 454 regular season wins, and his 63 playoff victories are the most by a goalie who has not won a Stanley Cup. Remarkably, he became the first goalie to win 30 games in one season as a member of five different teams. After retirement, Joseph spent several years with his family as he focused on being a good father, a father he wished he had. He is proudly raising seven kids, showing no hesitation at the chance to foster his own nephew. In 2016, he became a goaltending coach for the Carolina Hurricanes, putting his 19-year career to good use to mentor the next generation of goalies. And in 2018, he became the Toronto Maple Leafs ambassador. Curtis Joseph will be remembered for his winning attitude, optimistic nature, and desire to prove his doubters wrong. For a sport that favors the privileged, he certainly was not. But just like any mad dog, he was always going to keep clawing and digging to make a name for himself. When you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. And Cujo proved that despite his tragic upbringing, all it took was a dream and an unrelenting work ethic to find success. Life didn't start out too easily for him, and he could have so easily accepted his fate, but that was not Cujo. He decided there was no use feeling sorry for himself, and he started to develop a glass half full mentality to cope with his difficulties. He was overlooked time and time again, and each and every time he battled even harder to force himself back into the conversation again. He's currently outside looking in for induction into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Will he continue to be overlooked? We'll have to wait and see, but when all is said and done, he will always be the diamond in the rough, ultimate underdog, Curtis Joseph. That's it for now, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video and would like to support the channel, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. See you soon.